dwie stare kartki pocztowe pisane ręką mamy, kilka odrestaurowanych i pieczołowicie przechowanych fotografii, to wszystko, co pani Sali Goldblum cudem pozostało po całej rodzinie. Po najbliższych, wymordowanych i spalonych przez Niemców w Auschwitz, po świecie dzieciństwa, który pamięta. Sali przeżywa zagładę dzięki jednemu przypadkowo spotkanemu człowiekowi. Oto jej historia. I was born in Poland, in Katowice, in um, uh, 1935, so I was um, actually four and a half years old uh, before the war began. Uh, my father was um, a butcher in Katowice, and he, um, uh, he had three butcher stores. So my father and mother did quite well, and they lived very nicely until the war came. My father was born in Dombrowa Gulnicza, so when the war started, um, we were expelled right away from Katowice because we were Jewish, and um, uh, we became refugees, really. We were not allowed to take anything with us except what we could carry. So we wound up going to Dombrowa, where my father had his parents, uh, many brothers and sisters and, and their families. So it, it was a huge extended family. We actually lived with, with uh, some relatives in, in Dombrowa until uh, the time came. It was um, the fall of 1941. Uh, my father was um, uh, actually walking with his brother on the street in Dombrowa, and he was picked up by um, SS men. Um, it turned out that it was a mistaken identity, but it didn't matter to them. They charged them as being a political, and they were not but they took them, arrested them, and that was the last time that we ever saw him. And then a ghetto was established in Dombrova, and uh, my brother and I and my mother went to live in the ghetto. And n without any exception, the, all the ghettos that they established were horrible, and this one was very bad also, very bad. But it was a small ghetto, and we were not um, uh, fenced in by a wall. We were actually fenced in by wire fencing. Um, I was actually seven years old when we entered the ghetto, and I do remember a lot of it, um, actually most of it. As soon as we entered the ghetto, my mother and other young women uh, were, were taken away every day to work, there was, I don't know, the, I do not remember the name, but it's all documented. There was a factory just outside of Dombrova that um, slave laborers, Polish and Jewish, worked. They were not paid, and they were, uh, uh, there were women, all women, and they sold um, uniforms for German soldiers. And all they were given is a half an hour and a 10 hour day uh, for resting, uh, lunch, if you will. And they were given a bowl of some sort of watered down soup and, 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 uh, and two slices of bread. And the authorities, that is the Germans, uh, didn't really care that these people had children. Uh, the children were just left in, inside the ghetto. And very quickly, it became very obvious that men were beginning to disappear. Young boys, men, that they were the first to disappear out of the ghetto. At that time, it was still early, the, the, the concentration camps, you know, were not yet functioning. This was 1942, uh, at full speed. So they would take these young men and, and boys to uh, labor camps, slave labors. So eventually the ghetto became mostly old women 
mothers with children, very few younger people, men or women. And, and I was left uh, with my brother and there was no supervision, there was nothing. Uh, I took care of him basically. Um, we didn't have schools in the ghetto. Uh, we didn't have playgrounds, we didn't have uh, books, we didn't have toys, we didn't have anything. And um, so I took care of him. And, uh, and uh, the first winter, uh, it was actually February. And the house that we were assigned to in the ghetto didn't have anything, it didn't have heat, it didn't have toilets, it didn't have running water. It was one of those areas of the city that should have been torn down years ago, you know. So, um, so we, did, we were very cold and uh, so uh, boys, young boys, like 13, 10 year olds, would, would steal wood. They would rip fences, they would steal chairs, wooden chairs, uh, and, um, and make bonfires uh, right on the street. And we would stand around these fires. So one day, um, and I um, looked very Polish. I mean, I had long braids and I was very blonde and, and I have green eyes. I mean, and I spoke perfect, perfect Polish without any Jewish accents or anything like that. And um, I was um, um, standing on the street one day and somebody pulled at my braids in the back. So I uh, got angry because I, they used to do this to me, like the boys, the little boys, you know, always teasing me like that. So I turned around very angry and it wasn't um, a boy, it was a man. Uh, very short, almost bald man, and, and uh, he, uh, and I wasn't even scared of him. He, uh, he definitely, I knew he wasn't Jewish. He wasn't a Jewish man. And I knew he couldn't be a German, like a Gestapo or somebody, you know. So he had to be a, a Pole. And he asked me my name. And I told him my name. And he asked who this little boy beside me was, and I told him. And he told me his name. He's, and he said, my name is Pan Nikolai Turkin. Okay. So I was right, he was Polish. And he started to talk to me. And I talked back, and I talked, and I talked, and I was just so happy that I had someone to talk to. And um, he told me that he doesn't have any children, and he has a wife, and her name is Eva, and um, he lives, and he made motions like here and there, and he lives over there. and. The reason that he is inside the ghetto is that he has a job reading electrical meters and he's allowed to come into the ghetto twice a month. Spotkanie z inkasentem z elektrowni Mikołajem Turkinem zaważyło na całym życiu sali Goldblum, ale to już temat na nowe opowiadanie. Jan Wichrowski z Ukosak.